absolutely delighted to introduce um, the CEO of Radisson Hotel Group. Um, and uh, prior to being CEO of the Radisson Hotel Group, he was the chief executive officer of NH Hotels and before that with the uh, Disneyland Paris and before that with FMCG, um, uh, so with a completely different experience. And I'm, so I'm delighted to bring up Frederico Gonzalez, um, if everybody can show their appreciation for <laughs> Frederico for joining us today. Frederico, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. What a, what a real pleasure, because I, 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 I've seen you so many times uh, virtually. That's absolutely uh, right. And, and, it, and it's so nice to we see are, you. We, we exist. Okay, we are physically, I'm not taller. <laughs> No, okay, but uh, yes, yes, we are back and to looking smart, not wearing a tie. I noticed all the financiers were wearing ties. That's right. I, I heard what you said about the shorts. Yeah. I, I will not keep the shorts any okay. longer. But uh, Very I, good. I, I think it's a blessing gift not to have the tie any longer, if possible. Exactly. So I, exactly. I will keep that one, if possible. So you, 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 you agree with Mohammed Alibar's remarks That's earlier. Right. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. But I, I love in uh, uh, Fede's. Uh, um, CV, you know, you say as a global leader, your personal mission is to motivate, motivate and energize large organizations to be more ambitious in profitability, purpose, and people. This gives us a, a great segue to our session, which is all about innovation and transformation. And I love some of the stuff you guys are doing at Radisson in terms of innovation and transformation. We've been talking about it. I mentioned it right up front. This is really key to this event and Absolutely. all events going forward. We had the kids speaking this morning uh, with a competition. We had the startups presenting earlier. And so I'd love to learn a little bit. I think we'd all yes. like to learn as a big corporate, you know, where you've got those challenges of trying to maneuver and everything else, much easier for smaller um, SMEs. You know, how, how have you managed to, how have you managed yes. to pivot during this period of time in the last 18 months? Okay, I think uh, even before I talk about the last 18 months, I think what is important is when we look to change or transformation, I think we have learned during the last years, but even before the COVID, okay, I think we started a transformation of the company in 2018. And I think uh, what was very good is we learned there are four or five things that when COVID came, we could reapply. Okay, I think if you look to the elements that in our experience and in my experience drive change successfully and transformation and then innovation is kind of five points. Okay, the first one is the ability itself of the management team and the whole organization, not only to change, but also to adapt and do it on a continuous way. So. That is not an ability that nearly, I mean, that most of the companies have. It takes time to build an organization that has it. And we were fortunate that we, were, we, we had it when the COVID came. What allows you to adapt very quickly, because everybody's in the mindset that you need to change. You adapt very, very quickly, and you start thinking not only on how to cope with COVID, but how are you going to secure that you can exit this situation with a competitive edge versus your competitors. So the first one is that ability to change and adapt. The, the, the second one is the plan. Many times, many of us react to something, but we don't have a plan behind. We need to make the plan. I have been in many situations during COVID talking to people where all the discussion of the organizations were, how do we fix this issue and come back to 19? But actually the truth is that many of those companies in 19 were not in a good shape. So coming back to 19, is meaningless. I mean, maybe the markets come to 19, but our companies or many of the companies will not come back to 19. There were things in 19 that we had to change. So it, how long is this plan that you, you have in place? We, we did a plan 18, 19, then obviously it was 20, 21, 22. Now we need to erase 20 and 20, sorry, 21 and 22. So it now reaches 25. But I think what is important of that plan is, is first, it covers all the areas of the company. So that included changes in all the revenue management systems, in all the commercial abilities, in the organization, in the brands. We had a gift, if you wish, that we reorganized all the brands, launched new brands already in 17 and 18, and that has helped us out. But, but the second, beyond in, in, in the plan, you need to have a very good diagnosis. You need to have a plan that is concrete. And then third, 
Is you that plan built with the whole company? Is it built from the ground up, or is it led? That is, yeah, that is good. I, I think one of the elements that happen in change is, um, and, and then that links to how you make a plan. There is, you know, usually when you have a change situation or a problem, you, you pass them by different phases, you know? It's like with COVID, first you deny, then you kind of accept, but you are not happy with anger. Then there's a moment where you say, oh my God, we have an issue. Then you start recovering, and then there's a moment where you are convinced and you change. What happens with, with these kind of plans is, usually it's started, it starts by the top of the company, but obviously you, need, you are not as wise as to make a plan yourself with your executive team. So you need to engage all the company to do that exercise. And that is what happens is you are maybe already in a phase of conviction because you have done the diagnosis, but actually maybe 80% of the organization are not aware that we are even going to have to change because there were some problems that they are not aware. And I think in the hotel industry it's even more important because you have a huge amount of people in the front line that are not aware if the company has one or kind uh, of issue. So, so I think it's a, it's a process that usually takes uh, at least 12 months to engage all the company and, and then usually... And then communicating. Right, and then be obsessed on communication. And this is why a good plan needs to be very concrete, needs to cover all the areas, and needs to be very easy, to, very easy to explain. I, I'm able to explain uh, the seven areas that we have, that we have discussed with uh, in, in the five years plan. I'm able to explain that in a hotel. I talk to the people in the hotel, I say what we are telling, we are going to do, why we are going to do, what is the results we expect, and actually, everybody understands, and that is critical. Okay, but then so you first you need, as as I said, the ability to change, then the plan, then you need the people. Okay, people is possibly the most complex uh, exercise, uh, but you need to be aware that when you make changes, not everybody is for the change, so you need to help them change quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so if they want to change, fine. If they don't want to change, they need to leave, and uh, because you need a lot of positive energy, you, you cannot have fights of power or discussions. Wha once the plan is agreed, you need to go. But before you get to that plan, you're talking about change. Yes. How do you incubate that change? Do you, do you embrace the ideas from the youngsters that are coming through with ideas? Or how do you... Well, I, I think, I would say no. Okay? No, not as a principle. Okay? You may hear all the audiences. But I, I think all comes from a very disciplined diagnostic of what the company is doing well, what the company is not doing well, what are the opportunities, and what you need to change. It's like, for example, we came with, we didn't have all the brands positioned where they should. We were not covering all the brands uh, levels or opportunities we thought, and that's why we came with a new uh, branding, introducing Radisson Collection, introducing strongly and changing Radisson Red, reintroducing Radisson, for example, in EMEA. And when you think about it, Radisson was present in the US, was not present in, 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 in EMEA. We have now more than 100 hotels of mm -hmm. Radisson. Mm -hmm. So that was thanks to the analysis that was done and a very clear diagnostic of the company across all the systems and looking to many times uh, to the wisdom and the knowledge that many people in the company had already. So you, you kind of mix the knowledge of the people who are in the company when you arrive, together with new ideas, or when asking many things, why? Why we do this? I was going to ask you, wh what are the biggest obstacles to change? Well, the, the, the biggest obstacles to change, I think first, is lack of understanding why you need to change. Uh, and that's why, because obviously whenever you come to a new business or you, you come to a new organization, uh, many people are proud of what they have been doing. So they need to understand why that feeling of pride uh, maybe is not good enough. So you need to spend a lot of time on that. But I, see, I think the second is, is lack of concreteness. When you see plans of many companies, they have too much poetry, okay? Written by s maybe a third party consultant that fills the slides, but it's not concrete enough. So you cannot explain, you cannot measure, you cannot track exactly what that plan means, okay? And that's why we have 28 initiatives, you know? Out of the 28 initiatives, there is one initiative owner in each of them. I review personally the plan every three months. And I possibly am the only one in the company who has read all the plan. Everything. I've read everything. And that's, I think, the only way in which you can really show that the details of the plan are as important as the strategy. Okay, so your, your, um, your plan 
I think it's five year or a year, ten year yes. plan. One of the um, w one of them I noticed was scale, and I can only assume what you mean by scale, I as one of your seven players, is the is the exciting and massive pipeline yes. that you have, particularly in China. Yes, and and actually this is uh, again when we started the plan, we didn't count on the China boost, if you wish. Okay, but I think when you look today to the company globally. We have 1,200 hotels, 400 hotels in the pipeline, so totally 1,600. With great, great results in MEA, I mean, we have 450 hotels with nearly 100 in the pipeline. Great results in Middle East and Africa, where we, ha we have 100 hotels and nearly 70 in the pipeline. But what has come on top is we have closed a deal with Xinjiang, our shareholders, to build 1,000 hotels in China in the next five years. So what that means, and another 500 in APAC. But what that means is we will be able to double the size of the company. So for the right consumers in China, because it will be all Radisson Blues, Radisson Collections, or, uh, or, uh, or, Radisson, or Radisson Red, for many Chinese consumers, those will be the brand reference in the upper up scale. So hopefully when they come here or when they come to Europe, we will we will we will get some benefits. So that's an extraordinary transformation, isn't it? You it is. You've spent how many years getting to to? Um, it took us 25 years. 25 years to, to get to now. Yes. And and now you're going to double that in the next five years. That's right. Uh, but but and actually, but I think the magic of those because many of those hotels will be franchise in China. I think what is critical is that the company keeps its essence of being an operator. Okay. I don't want to lose the heart of the company as an operator of hotels. And that's why we are working very closely with Xinjiang to make sure that happens. Because at the end, we like the GOPs. You know, we like to see the revenues. We like to sell more expensive than competition. Mm -hmm. one, one of the key topics that, um, that we're addressing here, of course, is sustainability. And we had the sustainable hospitality yes. challenge. And, and um, we've got Wolfgang Newman from the um, Sustainable Hospitality Alliance speaking later. Um, I know you've taken a lead, but are we, w are we really doing enough in our industry? And, no. and are we uh, transforming this area, we are ESG? Not. And we are not. And and what, do what, what do we need to do? I tell you, I think it's just, I, I use many times the examples of the consumer goods companies. Okay? There is a rule in the economy, I think, worldwide, that if you don't self-regulate yourself, someone will come and will regulate you. So in consumer goods, many years, I mean, any of you who go to a warehouse, you will see a pallet. And the pallet is the same size in every world, in every country of the world. Why is this? It's because the retailers worldwide and the manufacturers worldwide got together and said, guys, we cannot afford this mess. Let's get to what should be the size of a pallet. I think in the hospitality industry, and we are very happy with the work that Wolfgang, who was in, in, in Dresden before, is doing with the with the SHA organization or with the work we are doing with the, uh, with the Travel and Tourism Council. But, but I think we are being too slow. I, I think there is one approach that only the big companies can afford, like trying to set carbon zero targets by X year. But that's not enough, because what we need to resolve in the industry is not the problem of the big companies, that we can all move in that direction. We have our own targets. We are all being more or less responsible. The issue is what happens with the thousands of hotels worldwide that do not belong to any of these companies. So a declaration of some companies, some big companies, to that they will move in that is not enough. I think we had a great success with the work we did with uh, the Travel and Tourism Council, with the World Travel and Tourism Council on the safe travel, where we were able to provide safe standards to many countries of the world, no matter if they were big companies or not. I think in whatever the industry announces, we need to accelerate and go quick to what we call the global hospitality sustainability basics. Okay. Five things, 10 things, 15 things that every hotel of the world will commit to, working with the distributors, so working with all the hotel chains and with the independent, with all the industry associations. We need to go fast because if we don't do it, we will have a world of eight, 10 companies moving in one direction and we will get regulations about the environment across all the countries of the world. And then those efforts will at the end create a mess. So I think we need to go faster, together if possible, and much deeper and wider in the effort. Okay. 
Um, well, that's 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 good to hear. That um, and and you're pushing forward with that, no doubt. Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, d tell me a little bit about um, uh, Radisson Collection, because that just seems like a bit of a transformational, particularly yes. in terms of the contracts. What are you doing? Uh, that is a bit that is different to some of your competitors. Yes, two 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 things or two thoughts. I think when we reviewed the brands uh, that the company was having, we saw two opportunities. I mean, as you know, Radisson Blue is the largest sample up scale brand uh, in all EMEA, uh, but we saw an opportunity to go above Radisson Blue as it was defined. Uh, this was what we defined as Radisson Collection. That is already a luxury experience. It is what we call affordable luxury. So it doesn't try to be at the top, top of the luxury, but something that is defined as luxury. And we have been tremendously successful. We have signed in less than three years 40 hotels uh, worldwide. Uh, many of the China hotels will be like that, and across all Europe and Middle East will get it. Same happened with Rise on Red uh, and with Rise on. Now, that is, that is what we did from a branding point of view to, to make sure that we would be relevant. I think from a contracting point of view, uh, we have tried to simplify uh, the contracts that we have, very clearly difference between manage, obviously lease, or franchise contracts. But I think, for example, when the crisis came in, se in September last year, we saw the need to launch kind of a signature brand that is, is, is rise on individuals that fully respect what the hotel is. Is a very is it was what used to be an independent hotel, becomes part of that. And for example, in that brand, we are able to offer a range of contracts from paying only on the revenue additional that we can generate or paying uh, a fee on the additional, uh, sorry, on the on the revenues that come through our systems or a more traditional approach where we charge based on the, on, on, the, on the total revenues of the total room revenues of the hotel. So I think we have been trying to move and be more dynamic. I think one of the beauties of the company is, is we have benefit from having made a big effort on organization across the world, both on development and on the operations teams across all the world, including EMEA and Middle East and Africa. So we have been able to execute many of those ideas with a lot of discipline, because a lot of work in developing the talent and in making sure that 99% of the people will be nearly great. Okay, okay. have been done. Just very quickly, uh, uh, Sami Suarez spoke earlier about the, um, what he, he believes that business hotels are gonna struggle because business travel is not going to come back like it was with technology that we have today. What, what's your view on that? Well, I, I think this is where innovation uh, comes, and I would say also flexibilization. I, I think what is going to happen, I tell you, we had two weeks ago an event that was the first hybrid conference that we had in, uh, we, we call biggest customers in the world, and we had uh, Dubai, London, Moscow, Stockholm, and uh, Frankfurt, all of them connected in an event like this. So we were like maybe 50 in London, uh, another 50 or 70 in each of the locations. We had common sessions that everybody else would be watching, and then we had breakout sessions among the others. The feedback from all the customers, well, we, we have been the first company doing something like this after the pandemic, but it was extremely effective. The trip maybe was shorter, or the event was shorter than it used to be, but it gathered maybe the relevant people on a country-by-country -country basis. I think coming with ideas like you know, hybrid meetings, hybrid rooms, where you can have the, that kind of equipment in, an own, in, in, in your own room. And I think variabilizing and giving a lot of flexibility to our offering. I think in the past, there was only one breakfast. Now there must be more. In the past, there was only one setup of the event. Now you need to get ready for an event that maybe is 300, maybe it's 500, or maybe it's 1,000. So you need to be building more plans at the same time and be ready for different situations. And I think linking that to how flexible the cost structure of the company is, is the critical way to succeed. Yeah, yeah. and having, having backup plans. Uh, backup uh, plans <laughs> is like <laughs> alternatives. I think, I think life in the hotel industry was very easy, okay, in a given moment. You would have yeah. a hotel, you would build it, you would build rooms, you would put breakfast, and then everything was running. I think that's going to be now much more the variety of services we'll have to offer is wider, but I think it's a great opportunity to bring new talent, to bring new ways of looking to things, and try to break the stereotypes that exist in the industry. Excellent. Well, listen, one last 
question for you. You've written three books. Yes. Um, and most people probably wouldn't know this, but you've written Living and Working Abroad. Yes. Um, in uh, how to live and work with the Portuguese and how to succeed in doing business the Swedish, Swedish way. Yes. So uh, no doubt this is something you do in your spare time. And uh, what's your fourth book? Ah, well, I, I'm, I'm about to write it. Uh, I'm in the process of writing it. Uh, but possibly it will be something about Paris and France. I lived eight years in, fr in, in France. Okay. I put some thoughts about France and Paris in, in, in the last book of working and, uh, and travel, uh, working and living abroad. But possibly it will be about France and, and the French country. Okay, lovely. Lovely. Well, would, I would everybody show their appreciation of Frederico Gonzalez? <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you.